All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. We are continuing our exploration this week of what I'm calling post-postmodern poetry and nonfiction, and we've just completed looking at our three poets for the week, Lee Young Lee and Frank Bedart and Louise Glick. And now I want to turn to two writers of nonfiction, particularly the memoir. However, in each case, there's a certain... I think because of the influence of postmodernism, among other things, there's a certain uh, transformation of the memoir into something that partakes very much of the the novelistic, the quasi-fictional, um, the essayistic, the the reflective. Um, in the case of Maxine Hong Kingston, and then there's a whole set of other complications related to Art Spiegelman with Mouse. And so I want to talk about these two works. And this will be a lecture on Maxine Hong Kingston, and then there will be a subsequent one on Art Spiegelman. So with Maxine Hong Kingston, um, it's interesting. One of the, I think there are, I, I mentioned at the very beginning of the semester that there are good aspects and bad aspects to teaching a course with a, what I would call a breadth approach, where we read a lot of different things that are mostly short as opposed to uh, a way I've taught this course in the past, which I consider a depth approach, where we read about five or six books. And we sort of spend the whole semester just looking at these books and going into detail with them. And I think that's very rewarding. You get to immerse yourself in certain worlds of literature and go very deep into their meanings and implications. But I think one of the virtues of the breadth approach is you get to read a lot of different writers and that allows you to really have a comparative sense across uh, different writers and shows you the real diversity and plurality of literature in a way that just reading a handful of books probably can't. So one of the things that's interesting to me about Maxine Hong Kingston is that we could easily compare her to some other writers we've read in this class, particularly, I think, uh, Amy Tan, who's working with very similar subject matter, a writer from a very similar background, and yet they produce two completely different works of literature, each a classic in its in its way and uh, in its period, uh, but completely different uh, in tone, in style, in implication. So in Maxine Hong Kingston's No Name Woman, which we'll be talking about now, we have a story that has certain similarities to Two Kinds, which we read by Amy Tan. Uh, we have the story of a Chinese-American family where the mother grew up in China, the daughter is growing up in the United States, and some of the tensions that that occasions uh, taking place in California, and yet uh, and taking place in the middle of the 20th century in, in presumably some period around the 50s and 60s. And yet we have two completely different literary treatments in Two Kinds, which is a short story that forms a part of a popular novel, and in No Name Woman, which is kind of a sort of a story slash essay that forms part of a memoir slash novel uh, called The Woman Warrior that is much more, I think, uh, literary, I would say. It's not necessarily looking for the the widest possible audience, though it's a popular, it was a popular book and I think still is to a certain extent, but is more interested, I think, in certain questions about uh, perception and memory and uh, and language than is than is Amy Tan. So Maxine Hong Kingston was born in 1940 in Stockton, California to Chinese immigrants. She was educated at UC Berkeley, uh, she's been married once over the course of her life with one child. She has lived in both Hawaii and California and has taught at UC Berkeley and the University of Hawaii. And she's known for works that blend memoir, history, and fiction in recounting both Chinese and Chinese-American life and has been praised and awarded for this. She's won the National Book Award and the National Medal of the Arts for these hybrid texts. And I think this idea of the hybrid text becomes more and more important as you go through the the end of the 20th century and i think it's a it's a key aspect of postmodernism where you have texts where the boundaries between things between genres in particular are not clear and i think we've seen that we saw grace paley's short story a conversation with my father 
but that read very much like a, a memoir, like a recollection. We've seen Ishmael Reed's Neo Hoodoo Manifesto, which was written in prose, but pu Reed chose to publish it in the context of his poetry. And it certainly didn't feel like a regular essay. It felt more poetic in its uh, in its kind of um, in its kind of mode of presentation. Uh, what else? We've had Gloria Ansel Dua with uh, La Conciencia de la Mestiza, which combines poetry and memoir and critical theory and uh, and polemical argument. Uh, so we and and I think Maxine Hung Kingston and Art Spiegelman are further examples of this kind of idea of a hybrid text, a text that doesn't really obey the rules of genre, the rules separating fiction from nonfiction, poetry from prose. These boundaries become much blurrier. Uh, and that's, I think, as I said, a clear consequence of an accompaniment to postmodernism with its idea of calling into question grand received narratives and letting in their place uh, grow and flower this proliferation of texts that can't be controlled by the prior way that grand narratives said that things had to be ordered and postmodernism's calling into question all of these traditional boundaries. So I think Maxine Hong Kingston, in a book like The Woman Warrior, which feels like a memoir, also feels like a novel. And I think some of her other works uh, similarly blend these things and also blend poetry and prose. I think these are hybrid texts of the post postmodern age. Um, Maxine Hong Kingston has this also goes back to a theme we've seen again and again in this course. Maxine Hong Kingston has been criticized by some writers within her community, within the Asian American community. Uh, for her portrayals. This is an issue we've been looking at since, I think, since we first read Philip Roth back uh, at the beginning of the course, who was criticized by members of the Jewish American community for what they considered portrayals of Jewish life and his work that they thought would aid the stereotypes of, of an anti-Semitic society. And um, I mentioned that Louise Erdrich had been criticized by uh, Leslie Marmon Silko for for sort of writing about Native American life in this postmodern style that Silko thought lacked a kind of activistic edge. Uh, and we see a similar story with Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, where she has been criticized by some in the Asian American community for writing that they thought perpetuated stereotypes or aided stereotypes, uh, particularly this goes also back to what we talked about with Ishmael Reed, because Ishmael Reed, uh, if writers like Roth and Kingston uh, and and Erdrich were criticized by those within their community for, for writing in certain ways, Reed, I think, in the African-American community was a major critic of other writers, particularly uh, Alice Walker, who he saw, he saw, I think I mentioned, certain feminist writers as perpetuating tropes of black men as predators in their writing about their specific travails of as black women within the black community. And Maxine Hong Kingston has faced similar critiques from within the Asian American community, particularly from a writer named Frank Chin, who sees the, the feminist uh, aspect of her work as doing something very similar, as perpetuating this Orientalist trope of the of the East as this place of, of the oppression of women, which goes back in Western, in American and European discourse pretty far. It goes back into the, the 19th and the 18th century. A lot of early feminist discourse in uh, Europe is sometimes tied up with forming this distinction uh, between the West and the East, the Occident and the Orient around the treatment of women. And so, and, and what I want to emphasize is that when Ishmael Reed and Frank Chin are making these complaints, I think they're raising genuine concerns about the ways that writing can play into these tropes on the one hand. On the other hand, I think Alice Walker and Maxine Hong Kingston are raising genuine concerns about the ways that there there are such a there is such a thing as sexism and misogyny and the oppression of women that exists in many different cultures and actually does exist in many different cultures um, 
irrespective of the way that fact has been misused in racist discourse. So I, I, this is an issue I think it's important to see in its proper complexity. Uh, I, I'm not saying there's, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. I hate when people say that. Um, I, I don't know why. Maybe I'm a bad person. But I, I don't think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I, I think there is there is there are aspects of the truth, though, in both of these positions. And we have to think very carefully through them to see where where we end up. And I don't think just dismissing either side really, really works, to be honest. Um, uh, so that's that. Uh, and that's one of the complexities of, of things that we've been talking about, like intersectionality. That's one of the complexities that arise when you when you take that approach on societies. Um, so that's that. Um, uh, I quoted from the Norton Anthology, as I usually do, uh, just to emphasize the idea of Maxine Hong Kingston as the author of a hybrid text that uh, The Woman Warrior, from which No Name Woman is an excerpt, is the first chapter, though each chapter is its kind of own freestanding text, so you're not, you don't necessarily need to read the whole, the whole book to get the idea. Um, it combines autobiographical fact with legends, especially Asian ones, to make a distinctive imaginative creation. So that is uh, the background of Maxine Hong Kingston. And just to briefly characterize No Name Woman, the idea of the of the text is that um, Maxine Hong Kingston, who kind of narrates in the first person, has heard this story from her mother about something that happened to one of her aunts back in China before the family immigrated. And what happened was that the aunt had had a child out of wedlock, or, or actually she was married, I think, and her husband had gone away to the United States with a number of the men from their village to kind of seek his fortune. And the mother and the aunt had apparently given birth to a child uh, as a result of some kind of illicit love affair or some kind of sexual assault. And the narrator, Maxine Hong Kingston, sort of considers both of these possibilities. And then um, as a result of this, the uh, they their house is attacked uh, by villagers who are kind of punishing her for this sexual transgression, and then she ends up killing herself and the baby, drowning them in a well. And so that's the basic story, and we're told this story right away at the beginning of the text, and then the rest of the story is Kingston's kind of thinking and reflection and meditation and reverie over what this means for her and what this means for her as uh, as a Chinese-American person, what this legacy means for her. And she ends up essentially identifying with this aunt, that her mother tells her this story. Her mother tells her that you can't tell anybody this story. This is something that's uh, that we must remain silent about. And Kingston is sort of takes this on as her own legacy. She thinks of her aunt as her precursor. And she uses it to reflect on both the the status of women uh, in the world, that her aunt was subject to this. Um, and she doesn't know, you know, she one of the things that makes this, I think, a hybrid text, a text that is non-fictional but also partakes of fiction is her speculation she doesn't actually she only has the simple story her mother told her and she sort of takes it and runs with it in several directions in her imagination thinking that think imagining her aunt having a love affair imagining her aunt being assaulted imagining what her aunt is thinking as she kills herself and the baby uh she, so she projects herself into this story and sort of takes it as creative material for speculation to form her own identity as someone who, as a woman, does not want to be subject to this these forces. And then also she takes it on as part of thinking through what it means to be Chinese American and what 
uh, the difficulty of separating out the kind of authenticity of her heritage from from the stereotypes that she herself ironically would later be accused of perpetuating in a further instance of this difficulty of separating what is authentic identity from what is something constructed out of media representations and literary representations that come from outside the community. So that is the complexity. That is the way in which I think this is post postmodern. Um, why do I say post postmodern? Why do I not think it's fully postmodern? Well, I think there is this drive, this interest in the truth, in the origin, in the authentic that motivates this narrator. There's a kind of intellectual and creative quest happening in this work that makes it more than merely flippant about the possibility of truth in the way that certain postmodernist texts like Paley's Conversation with My Father or Le Guin's Schrodinger's Cat could be. And yet, the book is also structured by this anxiety that you never get to the truth through language and through representations, that these will always somehow mislead you or draw you back into the labyrinth of simulacra that is, in fact, what racial stereotypes are. And so there's this postmodern anxiety that 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 harries and 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 harasses this text that, that that harasses this author's desire to reach some kind of truth and i think we see this in this passage in particular which is pretty uh early in the story when her mother tells her your aunt gave birth in the pigsty that night. The next morning when I went for the water, I found her and the baby plugging up the family well. Don't let your father know that I told you. He denies her. Now that you have started to menstruate, what happened to her could happen to you. Don't humiliate us. You wouldn't like to be forgotten as if you had never been born. The villagers are watchful. So she receives upon this moment of her entrance into maturity as a woman, she receives this this brutal inheritance of this story that she can't share, that she can't pass on, that's given to her as a warning. And so what could be more uh, sort of uh, brutally real than receiving this terrible story at this point in her life? And yet the narrator then, after recounting this dialogue, goes on to reflect, to meditate, even to perseverate on what it might mean. Whenever she had to warn us about life, my mother told stories that ran like this one, a story to grow up on. She tested our strength to establish realities. Those in the emigrant generations who could not reassert brute survival died young and far from home. Those of us, those of us in the first American generations have had to figure out how the invisible world World, the immigrants built around our childhoods fits in solid America. The immigrants confuse the gods by diverting their curses, misleading them with crooked streets and false names. They must try to confuse their offspring as well, who, I suppose, threaten them in similar ways, always trying to get things straight, always trying to name the unspeakable. The Chinese, I know, hide their names. Sojourners take new names when their lives change and guard their real names with silence. Chinese Americans, when you try to understand what things in you are Chinese, how do you separate what is peculiar to childhood, to poverty, insanities, one family, your mother who marked your growing with stories from what is Chinese, what is Chinese tradition, and what is the movies? So she's caught in this problem that we saw introduced very early on in the course when we looked at Baudrillard saying we live in this world of simulacrum and she lives in this world of kind of ethnic simulacrum. What is Chinese tradition and what is the movies? And it's kind of doubled by the fact that she senses that her mother tells her these things with a kind of double intention. She tested our strength to establish realities. Impression of women. Um, so she talks about the depilatory string that her mother subjects her to and that her mother had been subjected to. And she talks about the tradition in China of foot binding, um, which is a, a kind of um, practice of um, reducing the size of women's feet through a kind of systematic um, restraint on the feet that's very painful that is sort of tied up in gender ideology. And so she sort of sees herself as the heir to this uh, gender oppression, and she sees herself as complicit in it. Uh, she says, 
they want me to participate in her punishment, and I have, by sort of maintaining the silence that her mother enjoined upon her until that is she writes this book, which breaks that silence, um, but that perpetuating the, the exile, the forgetting of this woman is her participation in her punishment. So she's concerned about the reality of gender oppression, her participation in it, and is attempting to expose it and undo that participation in her memoir. So that is Maxine Hong Kingston with her post postmodern work of nonfiction. Uh, and so uh, and then we will have a subsequent lecture on Spiegelman's Mouse. Thanks very much and have a great day.